Everybody, welcome to another installment of Show to View with Mike G, the show of life, the show of Tuxka, the show of entrepreneurialism, Ohio, Jalisco, and so much more. You know, I've really been into Sotol these past few years for a lot of different reasons. But one of the main reasons is Flor del Desierto Sierra, one of the best bottles. And when you backtrack and say, well, where does this bottle come from? Who brings it in? Then we're talking about today's guest, Ismael Gomez, founder of Leica Spirits. And we talk about all these projects that he's working on, education, lack of social presence online, and really interesting stuff. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy this great chat with Ismael Gomez. In, um, in Guadalajara, which is the city where I grew up. Mm. So my family is from there. I come to the United States uh, to go to school. After you graduate, you know, just like most of us, we're trying to figure out what we're going to do. So one day I had a crazy idea of um, starting to, to start import tequila. And I call it crazy idea because I had no idea what I was getting myself into. What did you study and, for? Because going to school meant you had some focus, you had a no, subject. No, not necessarily. I went to school for business marketing and I choose business marketing just to pick something, yeah. to be honest. Does it, do, are, are your folks business minded? Are they entrepreneurs too? No, not really. No, 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 no. You, you know what? It's, it's very funny that you say that because when I'm out there selling, a lot of people without me, without even me mentioning anything about it, people ask me if this is my uh, family business. Oh, really? And it happens all the time. And I always have a strange look in my face and I'm like, no, not at all. And I would like to ask everyone, <coughs> why would I ask that? But no, not at all. Uh, I was you- working as a bartender and, and being frustrated in how the world in the United States was perceiving tequila. This, I'm talking about the early 2000s, late 1990s, early 2000s. You were bartending in Guadalajara? No, in, no, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, Chattanooga. when I was going okay. to school. Cool, cool. When I was going to school, I was working at a, at a bar. I was not a bartender, neither a mixologist. I was just working at a tapas restaurant. You work at the bar just making very basic drinks. But the children of the tequila was something that it was always present since the moment that I moved to the U.S. And I never understood it because, as you know, and most people know nowadays, in Mexico, we don't shoot tequila. And it was very frustrating because it was the spirit of where I'm from to, uh, that it was abused and misunderstood. Yeah. Uh, so little by little, I started educating my my, my bartender friends and, and um, trying to make him understand that you don't shoot tequila. In my trips to Mexico, every time I, I, every time I will go back, I will bring some cool tequilas or brands that were not available in the United States, like Tequileño, oh, yeah. or, or Siete Leguas, or Herradura, when Herradura was not owned by Brown Foreman. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was trying to change my friend, my close friends, um, uh, understanding of what tequila was. But so, but this, is a, this is a good question. Okay, so you, you come from this place, there's bound to be some pride there. You're just noticing this misinterpretation of the category. But as a kid and just in family gatherings and stuff, I, I hate to assume that tequila was a part of growing up, but was tequila just because of the proximity to the region? Was it close to you? Yes and no. I think more important than that, it's like the perception of alcohol in mexico it's mm. different i don't remember i mean most people can tell you when was the first time they had their first the first time they got drunk or the first time they had their first drink it usually happens when they're 18 or 21 or whatever was your case yeah i'm sure that if you ask most people in mexico when was the first time they had an alcoholic drink most people don't remember mm. Mm. when was the first time they got drunk perhaps you remember you remember when was the first time that you got drunk? But alcohol, like a, like sipping in your dad's beer or sipping in your dad's Cuba back then, 
it was not a big deal. It was something that you just will taste, man. And, and, yeah. and, and your parent, it was, it's, in Mexico, it's not as, I would say, that's taboo for you to drink when you are under age, which the drinking age in Mexico is 18. Mm -hmm. And you can easily get a fake ID when you are 15 or 16, which means that you're actually drinking when you are actually 12 or 13, in quotes, right. legally. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, with that said, we actually learn how to, uh, at an early age, and this, um, I think this is something cultural, you learn how to drink at an early age. And that's why shooting tequila didn't make sense, because if you shoot, I just want to get you drunk. Yeah, that's interesting. That's actually a great point, is that, you know, it's like sex in a sense. The countries that don't make it taboo and they don't frown upon talking about it or having it in the media, they have a generally better acceptance of it and a healthier <laughs> relationship with it. So I, this is great. So you, so now you find yourself in Chattanooga at the top of this place, <laughs> trying to tell people, just hold on a second. Yes. Be better, right? Right. I was like, hey, if you shoot the most expensive cognac in the world, it's going to mess you up. It's just that tequila, the one that you choose to drink, that you want to chew, that, that you shoot, that gets you drunk, and then you blame the tequila instead of blaming the person standing in front of the mirror. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So how does that... The tequila you, doesn't get you drunk. You get yourself drunk. <laughs> it takes... It's a good partnership, I think, between the, the right. bottle, you, you know? I mean, that's... You're you self drunk. So with, with, with all that said, once again, I was trying to educate my friends and, and, and to let them understand that tequila can be... Uh, consume as uh, and it's as interesting like the, like a wine and let's not even talk about mezcal because mezcal was not even in our in our in our, in our um, plans or in our, in our dreams. Mm -hmm. So one day I wake up with the idea of uh, importing tequila uh, because a friend of mine, a close friend of mine, uh, just uh, revealed to me that uh, he applied for an importing license and uh, he was bringing from from Colombia. And I was like, huh, you know what? Why don't I, why I don't do the same thing with tequila since that's where I'm from and I know yeah. France, so I make some phone calls. Believe it or not, one of the first, very first people that I got in touch with was Antonio Salles from Tequileño. Oh, yeah, Tony. Tony. I don't yeah. Know if you know him. yeah, I know him. So I was the first importer of Tequileño in the United States. What? When was in this? 2000, in 2008, we were the first people that brought tequila into the U.S. Uh, I was very green in this market. I was in a little, little tiny market like Chattanooga. And even though that had all the intentions to do big things with the brand, things did not work out. The, uh, the partnership that I had with my friend who was importing Colombia was not necessarily what I was looking for. And we decided to, to not do it again. And I and I started doing other things. And years later is when I decided to start another importing company. And uh, that was the creation of GDL Imports. And um, <clears throat> we had a partner in Mexico. And then we started importing. We created Trianon Tequila, which mm -hmm. is... Uh, and we started importing Trianon. Uh, being in the industry, we I soon realized that Mezcal, this spirit that I used to think was the cheap version of tequila, it was quite the opposite. Yeah. And I fell in love with the category. And from there, we started building our portfolio, which nowadays uh, we have, which is... Yeah, the, uh, I mean, that, yeah, and we'll talk about it because I want to talk about Sotolo, I want to talk about the Tuxca. But so, but you know, it sounds like you had... All right, so you wrap... Did, did you finish up at, in Chattanooga You're, when you were going to school there? Did you... Oh, yeah. yeah. Did you head back to Guadalajara or did you stay? No, no, no. It wasn't making sense for me to move back to Mexico trying to, to find a job. Yeah. It was the best thing to, I could do was to stay in the United States because there's more opportunities to do something. Absolutely. Hey, don't get me wrong. I, one day I want to move to Mexico and live there, but I want to be, as far as like money goes, I want to be settled. You don't yeah. want to move to Mexico to try to start a new life because it's not going to work out, my friend. Yeah. Well, tell, actually, and I, I might not know why. Tell me why that's so difficult in Mexico. Listen, I'm going to resume it to one thing. It's the lack of opportunities due to an economy that is not as strong. Got it. So it's just merely economical, probably not social. <laughs> okay. Sure. And, and, and economical and cultural. It has yeah. a lot to do with culture too. 
which is yeah. a, a touch to the economics that happens to any country. Understood. So these couple of years that you took off before bringing in your new tequila, were you venturing into other entrepreneurial things? Or were you... Oh, I tried to do everything, my friend. What ta- give me a couple of exam- examples. I, I, <laughs> well, the moment I met you, I, I knew the, the wheels were always turning. You know, I can see that in other people. Yeah, I tried to open a restaurant once. No kidding. Uh, I tried to open a, a, during the World Cup. And what, which World Cup was this? In 2006, during the Germany, uh-huh. I opened a f- soccer football a store that uh, uh, it only lasted like during the World Cup when we opened the doors. By the time the World Cup was over, we were like, oh, shoot, what are we going to do with a freaking <laughs> store? And we ended up shutting down a few months later because no one wanted to be at the store, you know, just like selling shoes and and uh, yeah. another horrible idea. So I can give you plenty of examples of that, but I was looking for, I was always looking for something that I that I wanted to do you know, you keep hearing this thing over and over that if you're not working for yourself, you're going to be working for somebody else's dream. Right. Yeah. And uh, that's kind of where my head was at. And um, yeah, once again, I thought there was an opportunity. I, I noticed that tequila was growing, that a lot of people were talking about tequila back then in the early 2000s. And I knew there was a, there was uh, something there. Yeah. You and, know, what's one, one element... Uh, because again, I, I really love this stuff that you've introduced me to. I've learned a lot from you, you know, which I, which is, I love that. I love that when that happened. But there's this concept you, you do, you create, you manifest the ideas, right? So you get these ideas and you build them. And I feel like I do the same thing. But in other people that are close friends of mine that want to do that, there's one thing that stands in their way. And that is fear. I don't know if it's fear of failure. I don't know if it's fear of one's own inabilities or one's own skill set. But did you ever, do you, it's that, I look you in the face and I don't see the fear. Did you ever have the fear? No. No, you know, one thing, one thing I realized that sometimes knowing too much, it doesn't work to your advantage. Oh. One of the reasons I started this important company is because I had no idea what it, what it was or what it took to start to import alcohol. If I would have known what it, you know, you know, what the TTV works and you know, <laughs> all of the taxes that you have to pay, the distribution yeah. politics that exists, not only in the United States, but within each state, I would have never got it started because I would have known too much. I see. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's an amazing way to look at it. Naivety pays off. Sometimes not knowing too much to start a dream, it's a good thing. And I'm not saying to do something, to do things in a stupid way. Mm-hmm. And I leave that up to you to think what's stupid and what is not. But sometimes too much information can get, on the way, can get in the way for you to move forward to, to, think, to get things done. I love can it. We use the, can we use French here? I mean, like some view of use of F words, if you don't mind. Sure, sure. I have a saying that I, I don't have any tattoos. But one day, if I'm going to have to tattoo something, maybe I will put the word, fuck it. <laughs> sometimes you have to function. Sometimes you have to function and, and, and live with a fucking mentality to be like, hey, yeah, I completely, I completely agree. What happened? Have you ever have you ever heard the saying? This is in the corporate realm a little more, but it does exist. But paralysis by analysis. Have you ever heard that? Yes. Yeah, that's what it is, right? <laughs> you, you you overthink it, and I'm with you, man. When it's just like you can worry about everything because I'm in the same boat with like having to understand TTB and taxes and all that shit. And sometimes it's like, man, fuck it, let's just keep moving forward, and <laughs> some, whatever happens will happen. You know? Yeah, that's incredible. You're all on the way. And then along the way, you'll realize to either this is what I want to do or this is not what I want to do. Yeah. And and that, answer can, that answer can only come from you. And another, another thing that I will say is listen to people, but at the same time, don't listen to <laughs> people because most people are going to tell you that you cannot do it, that you are crazy, mm. that... Uh, yeah, I just finished. I just finished watching. I don't know if you've seen um, Playboy. There's a Playboy in Amazon Prime. There's a Playboy uh, documentary, American Playboy. Okay. 
I haven't seen I it. I've heard recommend. of it, but it's good. I highly recommend. One of the best things I've seen in many, many years, many years, I want to say. And uh, I think document- that documentary says a lot about what we are talking here. Yeah. How important sometimes you have to listen to your gut and, and go get it and, and see what happens. Yeah. And see what happens, my friend. I, I, it's intuition is a huge, huge thing for sure. So, you know, you, you come back, you've got your tequila. How, is the market thirsty, pun intended, for other kinds of expressions of spirits and categories? Because we've got Foro del Desierto, which I, this was probably out of order, but then you've got Balancan, which is even a, an amazing, more destilado kind of project. But when, do you, when did you know for Sotol, for instance, that, okay, I think that this is going to be an emerging category. I think that people are telling me they need to taste more Sotol. How did that work? When I tasted Sotol for the first time, I tasted Sotol and I was like, what is this? This is delicious. Obviously, I saw the trend that was happening with mezcal. Mm. And I knew if this trend of mezcal was growing, that Sotol, it was, it was just a matter of time before Sotol was going to be discovered. Yeah, uh, and it was one of those things that I that I guess one of the few things when I was right and I was like, sure, so Tol is coming, it's going to make a big, and and now it, it is here. Yeah, you know, we're doing very interesting stuff with with Florida Desierto. It's a brand that is still growing. People keep understanding the category. They are now they understand the difference between agave and Sotol, mm-hmm. and, and, uh, uh, and it's great. It's great. It, it's, so finally, it's- Mexico has been understood for. Uh, in how rich it is uh, culture-wise. Yeah, which, which is, is something so vastly important to me because I and am currently making sotol and I'm making it in Texas from plants in Texas. But this progress, this, the spirit itself, I will always consult and share and make sure that Ricardo, for instance, or Jesus, you know, that these people are involved with everything. Because I'm borrowing a category in some sense, right? But I don't ever want people to think that I own that, that because I have the privilege of being a white dude that people look at or whatever, right? So what I, my question is, because I went into the liquor store the other day and I won't name the brands. And I know you damn, damn well know what the brand is, but I went in and someone asked me how I was doing. It says, good, I've been working on Sotol, smashing it in my driveway with a mallet. You know, I'm, I'm doing it, everything is, as much as I can by hand. And he goes, oh, that's that Texas spirit, right? Ismail, I lost my shit because this message of Sotol being a Texas spirit has been promulgated by white men in Texas. It's not wrong either, Mike. Well, I know the history, and but but but, but I, I'm not going to make a call here. I want to know how you feel feel about that. How do I feel about people calling, uh, saying that Sotol is from Texas? Yeah, and not Mexico. I think they're right. So, well, remember, before there was a frontier that will separate Texas and Mexico, Texas was part of Mexico. And before there was, a, before Texas was part of Mexico, there was a region of a, a culture that dates way before there were borders mm-hmm. around. And what is now day Texas, there were people making Sotol. So when people say that Sotol is from Texas, they're not completely wrong. If they're saying that it's exclusivity, there's a, this exclusive from Texas, then I have a problem. Like the same way that I have a problem that's with saying that Sotol is only from Mexico. I don't like the DLC for Sotol. I don't mm-hmm. agree with it. And I don't like the fact that Texas was left out just because Texas was on the wrong side of the border. Mm-hmm. Before Texas was part of the United States, it was a region that included Texas, nowadays the United States, and Mexico that were making these type of destinations. Do you ever see, because uh, for me, it's about unity. You know, I, I can't do this thing without Mexico doing its thing with those men and women. Like we all do it. It's a, to get, it's unity, you know? So it's always part of any time someone asks about Sotol, Mexico is always a part of that conversation. Do you think that, and I would love to see this, is there, is it even feasible that Mexico would share the deal with Texas? If they do, 
in makes Texas Texan people happy, good. And if not, I will tell my Texan friends, don't worry about it. You're fine. Don't let it take you sleep away because a good destination is a good destination, regardless if it has a certification that it states that you are from the Soto region or not. Yeah. I will I will put a smile on my face and, and move on. Which you, unlike probably many other people, you know mezcal, but you also know things that are mezcal, but aren't mezcal, right? So talking maybe specifically about the stuff Amando made for the Balancan label. So do you think we are too bound by the laws and too bound by terminology? Yeah, but it... But then you have to think about other organizations who are actually making these these bonds, these bonds, and it's actually in this case the government, mm -hmm. because everyone wants a little piece of the pie. So you cannot; they're, gonna, they're not only going to charge you tax, but they're going to charge you for a certification, which is another type of tax with a different name. Yeah, that's the way I see it. Yeah, and I think you're right. But you know, one of the big pieces of of your portfolio is Cruz de Fuego, and Tell me about, I, I know a little bit because it's Carlos, right? Is he one of the main producers? Carlos Mendez. Yeah. And, and Margarita Blas Carlos Mendez and his mother, Margarita, are business partners for Cruz de How did you meet them? What is that story like, the creation of this brand? So I met Carlos. Uh, I was looking for a partnership in the Mezcal world. And back then, there was an organization that you was... That with, related to the CRM, and they were giving information about potential producers uh, around the around the Oaxaca region. Mm -hmm. And I made a, and I got a contact from Carlos, and I made a trip to Oaxaca to taste different mezcales. And it was also my first trip to Oaxaca. When I met Carlos for the first time, and I remember tasting his espadín, and I absolutely loved it. And I remember tasting other other spirits that now they are nowadays are here in the United States and they're kind of big like Rey, Rey Campero. Mm -hmm. remember, Carlos Stan was next to the Rey Campero and I was tasting through everything, but I kept coming back to the Carlos Espadín because I absolutely loved it. And after I tasted most everything that it was in that uh, mezcal fair in downtown Oaxaca, uh, I approached Carlos and I told him that I was in Oaxaca with the intention of starting a, a, a brand. Mm. And I wanted to do a partnership with him. And uh, from there, we developed a very good friendship. And I not only were very good friends, but also uh, partners with Cruz de Fuego. And, and Carlos not only makes an excellent mezcal, Carlos and Margarita, but they are very honest, hardworking, and business people, which for me is as important as the juice that it's in your bottle. Yeah. And you, so now you know, you're married and you're living in the States. With, mm -hmm. with regard to your citizenship in Mexico, you can have, I believe, dual citizenship, right? If your parent, if your parents are both Mex from Mexico, either your mother or dad are Mexican, you can actually have the dual citizenship in quotes. But you need to have either one or the other. Oh, I see. But, yeah, but you can still be a Mexican citizen if you decide to go to Mexico and apply for your citizenship. You can still. Do that. And and that's something that. You know, there's many sides to it, but a lot of people find to be of real value and a real ethical element to mezcal companies is that they have Mexican ownership. And so, is it safe to say that the Cruz de Fuego that it's 100% Mexican owned? No, it's not 100% Mexican. No, I have partners in the United States that are not Mexican. Yeah, and uh, if that makes Cruz de Fuego not 100%. Mexican owned, then I'm not. I have a partnership with Hybrid Spirits, uh, who was founded by Kent Fredrickson, and uh, we all share ownership of the brand. I needed those type of partnerships in order for me to access to the American market, and I love it. I think the, the world is about partnerships, mm. and but the distillery in which the juice comes from, in this case, Carlos and Margarita, it's owned 100% by the family. It's a family-owned, operated business. The brand of Cruz de Fuego, it's a different business. In this case, ah, it's, I see. it's our label in which Carlos made uh, mezcal for us. And Cruz de Fuego is where the ownership resides in different parts. Even Carlos itself and Margarita are part owners of Cruz de Fuego. 
See, why this is important to me, it's not about structure, it's not about Mexico, America, any of that, but it's about transparency. I can't recall many other business owners just saying what you told me and saying this is how the company is owned. And actually, in your case, and I completely agree with you, having a diverse team that is both American, because there's no way that you have all the skills to do every single thing the best is, right? And so do you try to bring in people that... You rather, I'll say it this way. Do you know your weaknesses and how you can bring in other people in to pivot on their strengths? Right. You said, you said it for me. You read my mind. And there's things that I'm not very good at, and I'd rather delegate those responsibilities to someone who is actually good at mm. and perhaps enjoying the stuff that I don't like to do. And, and it's like you scratch my back and I scr scratch yours. And hopefully we can create this partnership in which it complements this puzzle for us to do amazing things. Yeah. Uh, Ken Ferguson, he's a master sommelier. So I respect a lot his, his states and his vision of doing business. And since we started working together, only great things have been happening. What do you see as something that you, you just aren't particularly good at in the business? Me? Yeah. Uh, you're putting me in the spot, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> it's always about, I'm always about, I'm asking you this question because I'm asking myself this question. You know, that's kind of how this works sometimes. Uh, I, I, you know, all of these TTB regulations and uh, accounting, uh, I'm, not a, I'm not huge in numbers. I'm not an engineer, neither I want to be one. <laughs> uh, but yeah, let's keep that answer short. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm, I'm right there with you. I have to get into the numbers, I but I've... I need to be better in social media. I, you know, I never, the, the, I never like you know being in the phone. I, you know, try to stay away from my phone as much as I can. Yeah. If you look at my social media, you're gonna find one or two pictures of me. Uh, I, I just don't like it. I just, I, I, I know it's important. I know it needs to be done. I, I'm doing the best I can. But if I can find someone that can help me, you know, and I can afford to take social media uh, for Cruz de Fuego and take it to a different level, I'll be all open about it. I, I have noticed that about what I would call a thumbprint or your footprint in social media. Very, very limited, you know, and it, it's, it's, it was hard to even find where you grew up. It's not out there, you know, and I, I, doubt, I doubt it's intentional that you're doing that. But if you just don't really care about social media, it's crazy how much that information is out there and that's how people sometimes get to know who you are. Yeah. But in this case for me, I want people to know what I'm doing more than who you are. You know, you know what, I know it's important. I know that it's important to some brands to be attached to, to an individual. Mm -hmm. um, but in this case, and in all honesty, I'm just the one that created the label of Cruz de Fuego with a cool designer that I know I, and come up with a name. But all the credit, all the credit go towards Carlos. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I take credit for is to make it available in the United States under a label that I created. Yeah. Other than that, I'm just presenting what it is. I'm not a distiller. I know about the process, uh, but I cannot run a distillery. So I'm always putting Carlos or Margarita or the brand itself in front of me um, before I talk about myself. And it, which is interesting is that I, I completely understand that. And be, g given how much stuff's gone virtual, are you okay? I mean, one, we're chatting. This, this is, I mean, I've, we kind of know each other, you know, I've mentioned yeah. stuff, but... <laughs> I know that you've done other kinds of education for, for the group that I run in Texas, talking about Destilado. Do you feel okay in that capacity, being out there and educating and doing the virtual tastings and stuff? Oh, yeah, for sure. Anytime, anytime. I love to educate. I do this even when I'm not working. Last night, I had people over at my house. Mm. Uh, I cooked some paella. And we started talking about mezcal and all of a sudden I was doing exactly the same thing that I'm doing when I'm actually getting paid for. And that's <laughs> when you realize that, oh, you know, once you start doing something that you love for a living is when you stop working. That was exactly what I was happening. It was in the middle of the night. It was 11 p.m. We were drinking mezcal and I'm saying exactly the same thing when I'm doing that I will 
sell that I will tell to a sales rep yeah. trying to educate them about trying to educate them about mezcal. And I was in my house, in my oh, living room, yeah. my dining room with some friends just talking about, you know, uh, what mezcal is, what mezcal is not. Mm -hmm. That's in, it's in, that's incredible. Because that's that's when you realize that you probably focused on the right thing in your career, right? Especially when it comes up from passion. Yeah. Something that you love, something that you like, or something that you really enjoy. And, and in this case, for me, it's not only a passion, but it's also a responsibility as, a, as, a, as, a, as someone from Mexico to be able to explain in the best way possible what these distillations are mm -hmm. and try to give as much credit to the producers uh, because that's who deserves the credit once again. It's, it's, it's incredible. And, you know, let's talk about the portfolio because when I look at, I use the term dream team. It was one of the first times, if not the first time, the U.S. had a basketball was part of the Olympics, mm. right? And yeah, you might know the, the amazing crew, like Jordan, Ewing and stuff. And so it's like these, the, the best players from their respective regions, I guess you could say, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have compiled a portfolio that is the best of the, these categories. Like you keep traversing different areas of Mexico, You've got Destilado from Jalisco and Oaxaca. Tell me now, how many marks total do you have in this the portfolio? Right now, we're working with, with four. Okay. And uh, we had five. We dropped one. And uh, we are planning for 2021 to bring uh, a few more brands. Cool. I'm going to keep it as a surprise because things are still, still that I'm working on. But uh, hopefully we'll have a uh, few more runs at the end of the, by the end of the year in, uh, in different categories that are necessarily not necessarily agave. Some of some of them are going to be agave related, and some of them don't. Uh, wow, that's incredible. People, people are going to be very happy. You know, one of the things too that I love, and because this is a personal favorite, and I, I want when everybody says sotol, and I, I love stuff that Ricardo's doing and the sotoleros, and but it's not as consistent to me because they're batch to batch, which is fine. But for some reason, the Flor del Desierto, the Sierra, that is, to me, a quintessential bottle. You have to have that bottle. And you told me you guys are working on some other kinds of cool things with the brand. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about what might be happening in 2021 for the Sotol brand? So at the beginning of the year, we got our first uh, shipment of our Carnet line oh. of Flor del Desierto, which is our Pechuga style Sotol distilled by Chito Fernandez in the Sierra of Madera. Mm -hmm. Using venison meat uh, and spices. In this case, we use apples, uh, pecans, uh, raisins to to do the maceration and uh, and, uh, and distill it a third time with venison meat. It's absolutely wonderful. Dude, when is it? Has it crossed yet? Yes, yes, yes. It's available in Texas now. It's, oh, it's on. The, I can get it on the shelf. I guess Victory's got it. Victor, Victor needs to place an order and get it in their warehouse so they can have it distributed in Texas. He just arrived like a few weeks ago oh. uh, to a warehouse in California. But it's okay. now available for, for uh, Victor to place an order, which we have that communication going. And Jesus is, is active. Jesus, the founder of Florida Desierto, is very active in the Texan, Texas market. Yeah, I'm sure that uh, Jesus is going to take care of, you know, uh, that for victory to yeah get to incredible it, is that a brand of which you also are part owned but or do you just import that one no i'm just the import okay yes import from the it's it's i mean that's man the spirit there it's it's just something that's so quintessential i'm not really sure how to describe it do you you know when you tell people because you do tastings all the time and they're probably wondering what satol is but what are some of the flavors? And I don't normally do this in these interviews, but I've got this one flavor. I want to see how you describe it for of that Sierra. But what are some tasting notes you give folks for that bottle? I'm, I'm gonna put it in a better way because I don't like to talk about flavors. Okay. When I when I taste people with Flor del Desierto Sierra, mm -hmm. I always tell people that it's like listening to the dark side of the moon for the first time. <laughs> but but the side one side A right like in order, in order. <laughs> You know? <laughs> because you know what you were doing. You don't remember. You remember that day when you listened to 
that album for the first time and that it's going to mark you for the rest of your life. That's what happened to me with when I tasted uh, Chito Fernandez uh, Sotol. It was wonderful. It was like, wow, there's no going back here. And uh, uh, that's it's uh, fun. I mean, you're talking to a music person, so I get exactly what you're saying. <laughs> Uh, it's not I, a good book. I'm going to talk about music only. <laughs> yeah, they, there, there's this kind of element, and I, I call it, like, it, it almost feels s- sandy, like sandpaper, but with citric acid and limestone and kind of this beautiful... Soil, grass, and yeah, it's, it's, like, it, it, it's prickly on your... on your, And that's that so, so tall note that I love, because it hits the same part of my tongue every time. You know, and I'm like, if, it, if that hits, even if it's cucharilla... So it's the same thing. It's just that no expresses itself differently. I think it's really incredible. So tell yeah. me, all right, good. Very unique. As a matter of fact, that spirit, every time I open a bottle, it brings me, it brings me back to my childhood, to when I used to play in the park and in the dirt and you, you smell your hands and underneath your nails after all that stuff. That was mm. in, I was in trouble before I got home because I destroyed my Clothes were destroyed. But I used to smell like that. Yeah. It was kind of how you smell, you know, that was the essence of your smell, was playing with the soul, with the dirt. So, uh, uh, so totally, uh, that so totally in particular gives me flashbacks of my childhood. It's that's, a, that's the best way how it, uh, that I can describe it uh, without using uh, taste mm-hmm. uh, terms or. or mm. There, you, you know, there's. It rains, you know, a fair amount in Texas, but they're up the street from me. We call them a gully when I was in the Midwest, but just can consider it kind of this like a real weird grassy hill thing that's lower than the street, right? And it's got dirt walkway and everything through it. And every time after it rains, you smell the soil and you smell the chlorophyll and you're like, oh shit, this is so tall. <laughs> it, it's just perfect, you know? I like to describe experiences when I'm describing flavors more than flavors. Yeah. Well, because flavors are, it leads you. Yeah. It, it's, it's a little subjective, you know? Mm-hmm. All right. So I want to tell one about one of these other players in this, this incredible catalog. I didn't know. Cause all right. So Mazonte has, they've got Tepe, right? Mm-hmm. Which is a colloquial name for a type of drink made in Jalisco. Mm-hmm. Ricea now has got some legal definitions and stuff, which is however, doesn't matter. But Tuxka is also another name. Oh, Tucci is another one, right? Mm-hmm. Tell me, it's so obscure and it's so esoteric. Tell me why you bet and why you doubled down on Tuxka and bringing that into the state. I was in, uh, uh, took a trip to Italy, you know, when I keep hearing about these. Uh, Big easy bar called the Jerry Thomas Project uh, from this guy called Roberto Artusio. And he also had a mezcal bar mm. in Rome, Italy, which didn't make any sense. Yeah. So I went, knocked at the door, and they, they spoke in Italian. All I had to say was the word mezcal. And I am here, you know, just trying, looking for Roberto Artusio, I mean, Scott, whoop, they opened the door and they let me in. I was like, I guess that was a magic word. <laughs> and I got to, and I got to meet uh, Roberto or conversations were about Mezcal, you know, I had a bottle with me and, and we tasted some stuff. And uh, I remember I was walking through the bar when I got to see a bottle of Flor del Desierto there, which oh. is related to the Tuxa question, but uh, for me it was... It was very crazy. And he bought the bottle on a trip to Mexico. But it was a bottle of Florida the Seattle City in uh, Jerry Thomas Project Bar, which uh, was totally unexpected. And it was a really cool thing. So from there, I left the bar and I walked towards the Mezcaleria. And, and on the window, as part of the advertising, they had the words tequila, mezcal, sotol, raicilla, tuxca, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, what the hell is tuxca? So I got back home and I started uh, researching what Tusca was. And to my surprise, I realized that it was a distillation from Jalisco mm. and that it came from this specific region. And it took me a couple of years for me to be able to find a Tusca producer because there, there are not very many. 
Yeah. How big and is that? Because really? they are confused with Rysia producers. And, and Rysia and Tuxka are not the same. Yeah. Because uh, Tuxka comes from a specific region of Jalisco. Just like in quotes, Rysia comes from a specific region of Jalisco. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, I think Rysia comes from everywhere and nowhere. And, um, but well, I think that's a different conversation. Yeah, but no, I think that's an interesting one. And we'll, when Rysia becomes something that more people know what that is, then, then you and I will have to continue to talk about it, you know, because I'm learning about it. The law is very, the suggested laws on this one are, it's really, really convoluted compared to the other noms, you know. But how big is the region where you would make Tuxka? And how I don't know to answer your question because I haven't done enough, enough research to understand in reality what uh, Tuxka comes from. The, but the best answer that I can come up with, and if you go to your Google Maps and if you type the word the word Tuxca Cuesco, mm -hmm. Tuxca Cuesco is gonna show you just a small region right on uh, region right on the foot of the volcano of Tequila, mm. by, which it's what are which are mostly two towns, Zapotitlan de Vadillo and Las Canoas. Okay. Um, in other areas from from that region and the this the tree trunks still that i've mm -hmm. seen that from the balancon that, that i've had it it's just like technology remained unchanged you know what i mean like is that one of the reasons that you were so drawn to it is how primal potentially you could call it i mean when once you see their operation and see how they're making destinations and, and, and if you have an idea or a slight idea of what what it takes to distill something and you're seeing these guys using a tree trunk that is actually hand carved with knives and axes to actually, once again, to create a distillation tower uh -huh. for something this imperfect, which is a tree trunk. It's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. And it makes you scratch your head and, and really understand for how long Distillations, not fermentations, but distillations are being happening in, in this part of the world. Forget about Mexico, because I'm sure they were happening, they were happening in that region before Mexico was called Mexico. Yeah. The distillations were happening in that part of the world, regardless of what the name was. And I and it, it's it's just a fast it, it made me realize I probably just want to get a tree trunk and try to do it. You know what I mean? Because love my friend, send me some pictures. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Plenty of trees and people. <laughs> hate cedar around here. So it's the first one that we <laughs> chop, chop it all down, you know? So got a couple questions left for you, but I know things have changed profoundly for everybody and the booze industry has both been good and bad during COVID. But for you, actually, you know, I, I was just talking to uh, William Scanlon and he said, he, you know, he's traveling a lot less and he's mm -hmm. been selling the same amount. And he's just now saving all that money in travel. Are any kind of patterns you've noticed since shutdown? Yeah, same thing. Same thing. My really? travel is low down, and my sales are not as as good as I was expecting. You know, I'm not going to deny it. I think there's always room to improve. Mm -hmm. But uh, the fact that I'm not traveling somehow is compensating my business for for us to stay afloat. But I strongly believe that 2021 things are going to start opening up. And together with these other products that we're going to be bringing this year, hopefully, you know, uh, we'll be we'll be in better shape. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's a really, we need some optimism, you know, and that's a really nice source of optimism. That yes, always. For sure. Well, yeah. it, you are married and you both own the Spirits Company. Does that ever get complicated my, my wife was very involved at the beginning of the of the operation because she was just very very good in organization her organization skills are great which i think that i was not very good at back then i'm mm -hmm. getting I'm better at i'm better at it now but nowadays she she's been stepping uh, away little by little now she just pretty much oversees certain things mm. that she used to be involved with and now she is actually in the cannabis industry that's what oh. most of her time uh, we own a cannabis why don't what she does uh, which i do at the end of the day. 
<laughs> a cannabis farm in uh, Northern California, in Mendocino County. No we kidding. A legal farm, and we sell, uh, we, we farm high end cannabis, and we sell to local distributors. That's, gr- that's all, great. All dancing dogs, now it's a commercial. Dancing dogs, if you guys want to check it out. Yeah. It's, a very interesting, it's a very interesting operation. Yeah, well, I think the fact that you kind of got fingers in both of those industries, I think is really fascinating because you saw how Sotol and Mezcal was trending up and now with kind of, de- thankfully, finally decriminalization and more legalization and stuff. I think it's a really good time to get into it. I'm just a guinea pig, my friend. Yeah. So I'm the one, I am the one that these guys test all of their products. They put me in a, in a room, they get me to smoke, and they just make some notes. So I'm like the uh, lab rat. Mexican sound like lab rats here. Yeah. Yeah. Most of these and, and, and see, I want to see how you react. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so I get to smoke some pretty cool stuff that she, that they, uh, uh, that they grow. Yeah. And all beautiful, beautiful flower plants. That's incredible. Yeah. I, I, I would love that. It's like, well, we need you to be a mezcal taste tester. It's like, Okay, fine. Just put me in the lab. I'll put the jacket on. Whatever, whatever it takes. <laughs> it's not not a bad way to make a living. Well, the last question I'm we have a daughter, so I wonder when she starts growing and someone asks her, "Hey, what do your parents do for a living?" <laughs> oh, my dad sells tequila. My mom sells marijuana. All right. That, I mean, she's going to be the coolest kid. <laughs> <laughs> gonna, you, I know what you. And I wish I had that story when I was growing up. <laughs> yeah. So let's, this will be the last question for you, but mm-hmm. I'll keep going back to this Sierra, that this, this is so tall, but so let's say you're sipping that anywhere in the world, right? Doesn't matter. But you could have a drink with anybody living or deceased and just have a nice thoughtful conversation with them. Who might you pick? Hmm. I think this this answer is gonna take you by surprise, and maybe because this is fresh in my mind. Mm-hmm. But I will say Hugh Hugh Hefner. Oh man, well that's uh, he got a lot of flack after he died because people I guess didn't want to give him shit when he was alive, which is strange to me. But I I get that. Watch that documentary, Mike. Yeah, I want to. But whoever is listening, watch the documentary and then you understand what I'm talking about. Yeah. Well, entrepreneur he was, through and through. He, he, okay, he was a visionary. He was seeing things in a different way. He was not afraid of of uh, what people were what was going to talk about him or, or nothing. He was just decided to make a revolution, and he changed the world literally, like many other people. But that's the first person that came to my head because yeah. I can list plenty many of them. Um, but that's, yeah, I think that would be him. It's great. No, and I, I, I definitely need to watch the documentary now. I've been looking for things to kind of wrap my mind around a little bit yeah. more, you know? So, well, I'll it's... It we can have a talk. And, yeah, I'll check it out. And we'll, we'll, we'll kind of we'll reminisce about it and talk as critics, right? We'll do the thumbs up and thumbs down thing. So, well, it's, my, it's fi- finally got to get to know more about you. You know, we've been working together on stuff, but it doesn't always get so personal. And I'm glad it did. So I really want to thank you for taking the time out. And I'm sure we'll talk soon, man. No, it's always a pleasure. Cheers. Talk to you. Cheers. Thank you, man. Thank you. So there we have it. Ismail Gomez, founder of Leica Spirits, importer of many things. His mind's always working, focusing on those next projects. Incredible stuff. For instance, at Balancantuxka. I know these are words that seem quite foreign in our vocabulary, but try this thing. You know, it's crazy the styles of distillation that they have there in Jalisco. And it's something really, really unique. Always like talking to people whose wheels are always moving. What's next? What can we do to improve these categories and bring more eyes to these beautiful spirits? So thanks, everybody, for listening to Show to V with Mike G. No matter how many pieces of lyrics you're looking at on the floor, these damn notebooks that get paper all over the floor, or if you're thinking this weekend I finally don't have that much to do, I'm going to enjoy it. Please. Keep dancing.